Um, in the past few months, I've been working on the integration of a cryptographic API with configurable, uh, configurable hardware and software backends in Riot. So um, I'll just jump right in. So on the first slide, um, we can see the current crypto support in Riot. Um, so far, Riot provides built-in software implementations for some important hashes and ciphers, as well as access to various third-party libraries. All of those are pure software implementations, which all run on our supported platforms. Um, unfortunately, software cryptography provides uh, proves, to by, uh, do be, whoop, proves to be quite inefficient. Um, here you can see a variety of cryptographic backends with which we could and should extend our crypto support in Riot. So in addition to the aforementioned software libraries, um, there are some MCUs which have integrated hardware accelerators and are much faster. Um, some hardware accelerators come with additional protected key storage, which makes them not only faster, but also protects the key material. And then lastly, there are um, external devices which offer tamper-proof key storage and their own crypto processors. Those are connected to other platforms and usually communicate via serial interfaces. Those are not necessarily faster than software, but they enhance security by protecting the key material. So let's delve a little deeper into the topic of protected versus unprotected keys and how to handle them. So the currently supported implementations in Riot work with unprotected keys. In this case, keys are stored in RAM or ROM and passed to cryptographic implementations as parameters, which means that these keys can be used with any implementation or driver that accepts plain text key material. A user who wants to develop um, an, an application can freely choose between implementations. These drivers that are not dependent on the key location and can be interchanged are called transparent drivers. Um, the next thing is the handling of protected keys. As I said before, in this case, um, the, the platform has a protected key storage. Those are dedicated storage areas, which are often in the form of key slots, and um, those can only be accessed by the crypto processor. In this case, the caller who wants to perform an operation only provides a key identifier or a slot number with which the key can be found in storage. And in this case, only the driver that is associated with the platform, uh, with the processor in which the key is actually stored in, can perform the operation. Those drivers that are bound to a key location are called opaque drivers. So I have said before that we should support hardware crypto, uh, yeah, that we should support hardware crypto operations. And um, now I can back that claim up with some numbers. Um, yeah, so for a performance study, we measured and compared the resource consumption of multiple implementations in hardware and software. I mean, this, on this slide, you can see a selection of results in which we measured symmetric cryptographic operations. Um, in the upper left corner, you can see the results of the accelerator on the Nordic board NRF 52840. And this one is much faster than the other implementations we've measured and uh, mostly faster than the software implementation, which you can see below, which is the built-in Riot software implementation of those algorithms. On the right side, you can see the results from a secure element. Um, as I said before, this is not faster than software in this case. Um, so yeah, when we use symmetric operations, the secure elements only gives us the benefit of protected key storage. Um, the use of this particular secure element uh, pays really off when we use it for asymmetric cryptography though, because in addition to protecting the private keys, it's also faster than software. Again, the accelerator on the Nordic board outperforms all other measured implementations. 
So um, what are our challenges in integrating all this stuff in Riot? Um, Riot supports many diverse platforms. Some of those are capable of hardware accelerated cryptography, others are not, but we need to perform operations on all of them. Also, we want to be able to use protected key storage if it's available, but we also want to be able to use keys from outside and that we have to provide to the implementation. Um, we want to make the use of hardware transparent to allow for hardware agnostic application development. And this can be achieved by adding a unified crypto API to Riot beneath which we can interchange backends according to our platform's capabilities. And as a solution to this, we propose that we implement the ARM PSA crypto API. So what exactly is the PSA, crypt is PSA crypto and why should we use it? Um, PSA is an abbreviation for platform security architecture, which is a framework that provides guidelines for the development of secure IoT systems. It consists of four stages, which you can see on the right side. The stages are analyze, architect, implement, and certify. And for all these stages, they provide resources such as example threat models, specifications for hardware and software design, and several reference implementations. When developing an IoT system using the framework, there's the possibility of getting those implementations tested and certified by the official PSA certified scheme. Um, part of that certification process is an open source test suite that is implemented in C language and openly available on GitHub. So where exactly can we find PSA crypto in this? Um, PSA crypto is part of the implementation stage along with to other functional APIs called Secure Storage and Attestation. These APIs are user-facing and enable developers to utilize um, services of the, this architecture. Um, the APIs are meant to be platform independent and suitable for IoT devices, and they are designed with usability and portability in mind. So what do we get from PSA crypto? For once, we get a complete API design specification, including guidelines on how to securely perform cryptographic operations. We get the architecture test suite, which we can use to verify our implementation. And under the hood, we can implement PSA crypto however we want, as long as we return the correct results and error values. This implementation freedom gives us backend flexibility. That means um, if an application uses PSA crypto, we can ex exchange the backends that perform the actual cryptographic operations and combine them as needed. This also gives us the possibility of combining multiple secure elements if we want to. Those secure elements will be handled by a driver registry. That means that um, secure element drivers are registered in a list and calls for cryptographic operations are then dispatched to appropriate drivers depending on the key location. Um, ARM developers have already developed a specific secure element interface that we can just adopt for our implementation. So so another huge benefit that comes with PSA crypto is the key management, which is, um, which is, which supports both protected and unprotected key storage. Um, I have two examples that show how exactly that's going to work. Um, in this first example, I show how protected key storage works. In this case, an application wants to generate and store a key on a secure element, which we can see on the bottom. Um, in our PSA crypto area, we can see that we have a key manager, then an array of key slots in local memory, and a secure element driver, which is assigned to a specific location value. An application that wants to generate and use a key on that secure element now has to provide some key attributes. 
and part of those attributes is the location value um, of the device that the key is going to be located on. Uh, the, the application just passes that attribute struct to the generate key function. And the key manager looks for an empty slot in the slot array and stores the attributes in there. Then it invokes the secure element driver that is associated with the location stored in the key attributes. And this triggers an operation on the secure element. There, a key gets generated and stored in a key slot, and the slot number um, of that key gets passed back to the key management and is going to be stored in this slot array alongside the other attributes of the key. Now, the key manager will specify an identifier um, to that key, for that key, and return that one to the application. And now the application can call cryptographic operations and pass that key identifier that which will be used later to find the key again in storage and perform operations on it. So now if we want to provide key material ourselves and not store it on any other platform, this works quite similarly, but we have to import the key instead of just generating it or passing it as, uh, as parameters. So in this case, um, in addition to the key attributes, we also have to provide the actual key material. And we call the import function. Um, so now, again, the attributes are, uh, are stored in an empty key slot in local memory along with the, with the actual key material. So instead of a slot number, now we have the actual key in here. A again, the key manager assigns an identifier and returns it, and that one can later be used for other cryptographic operations. So, as I've mentioned before, um, ARM provides several reference implementations. Um, reference implementations for the PSA functional APIs are currently being developed in Embed TLS. Um, they are quite advanced, but not yet finished. Um, yeah, we, we've been following their progress and we have been in contact with them and they have kindly answered our questions about their concepts and plans. Um, our main concern lay with the support and combination of multiple backends. And that is also where we differ the most from the Embed TLS implementation. They are planning to solve this problem by generating, uh, uh, generating a driver wrapper at compile time. Um, a user will have to provide driver description files in JSON format, and then a code generator will pass those descriptions, which contain info, information about the driver's capabilities, function prefixes, and more. And then it will generate this wrapper, which will contain calls to available drivers and optional software fallback. This code generator does not exist yet, so we don't exactly know what it's going to look like. Um, but we don't really mind because we actually have our own tools which we will use to configure the backends. Which brings us to the next section. How are we going to integrate this in Riot? Um, PSA Crypto will use kconfig for backend um, configuration. So if a CPU supports hardware crypto, then it defines a symbol. For example, has hardware AES-128 CBC. And if such a symbol is present at compile time, PSA crypto will be built with the default hardware backend. If there's no such symbol, then we get a software backend instead. Um, up until this point, there is no user interaction required. Um, as a user, I can just specify my platform and invoke the make command, and then I will get a working binary with, with a supported backend. If I want to use any other backend, then I can reconfigure that using the menu config interface. Um, here we can see that, uh, yeah, well, I have a little walkthrough here. Um, in the system section, we can choose the PSA crypto module 
Um, here, in this case, we choose that we want to perform a cipher operation, specifically a S128 CBC. And here we can see the available backends. In this case, we have implemented um, the, or in this case, we have integrated the Riot Cipher module, a hardware accelerator, and the TinyCrypt library. Um, how exactly is our implementation structure going to look like? Um, above everything, we have the PSA Crypto API that's going to be used by applications. Directly beneath it, we have a key manager and location dispatcher. Um, this instance will manage and access the key data stored in local memory, and then check whether a key is stored on a secure element or not. If it is stored on a secure ele uh, element, a dispatcher will get the appropriate driver from the registry I've mentioned before, and then pass the call to the appropriate secure element, which will then perform the operation. If a key is stored in local memory or in internal protected storage, then an algorithm dispatcher will pass the call to an algorithm-specific API, which may be implemented by some opaque or transparent hardware driver or some software library. In our case, we treat software libraries as transparent drivers. Here we can look at the algorithm dispatcher in more detail. Um, so, as I said before, the algorithm dispatcher will actually check which cryptographic operation is going to be performed and then pass the call on to a specific function. So, if we take our example from before, um, we want to perform a CBC operation on a PSA key type, uh, AES, well, on an AES key, and with, uh, with a size of 128 bit. Then the algorithm dispatcher will call the AES 128 CBC function, which in this case is implemented by a transparent driver. Um, this uh, gives us the possibility to combine different backends for different operations. So in case of a backend like the Nordic board we had before, um, that, that one only supports AES 128 keys and others could then be implemented in software. So this is what an application would look like that performs an AES encryption. Um, now, in this case, we want to provide our own key material, which is declared and defined in lines one and two. As I mentioned before, we now need to import that key first before we actually use it. Um, for that, we need to set some attributes, which contain the location that the key is going to be stored in, um, if the key is going to be persistent or not, and for the, the, actually, uh, the actual usage of the key. Um, in line 18, you can see the PSA import key function um, to which we pass the attributes and the key. And that function then returns a key identifier, which we then can pass to the PSA cipher encrypt function in line 21. So, how far along are we implementation wise? Um, we have managed to integrate the architecture test suite as a package and we can run tests for the hash functions. Um, now we need to extend the test configuration to be able to run tests on other cryptographic operations. Um, our key management can handle volatile keys in local memory and secure elements. And then the next step will be to add support for persistent keys. Uh, we have implemented some algorithm-specific APIs with different backends for hashes and ciphers and one elliptic curve. And we can combine these backends and um, build binary files that have multiple of these backends, actually. Um, now we need to extend our support for as many cryptographic operations and backends as possible to, to increase functionality. In terms of secure element handling, um, we can already handle multiple devices of the same type. Now we need to add support for other devices in Riot, 
and then make sure that we can handle multiple devices of different types. And now a little glimpse into the future. Uh, PSA crypto has the potential to support the use of um, trusted execution environments in the back end, such as ARM Trust Zone. Uh, we've already been uh, we've already started to look into that, and we are going to work on that in the future. So that's it from me. Thank you for listening, and now I'm open for questions. Not Lena. I'm looking forward very much to using this and um, not seeing any questions in the queue. It's my pleasure to ha ask one myself. Um, do you think that accessing in software keys um, through the opaque APIs will help improve the uh, security even of software only implementations? Is there other things that can be done now that we get more information from the application about how that key is used or when it should be cleared? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So op opaque drivers actually only work with protected key storage so far. So um, can, could what you I meant was, clarify? <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry, this was probably kind of too confusing. Um, now that the applications declare when they want keys, cle keys cleared, um, or have to do all the declarations they have to do anyway for the opaque APIs. Um, can the software only ones um, use that information to kind of see when some key should be zeroed out or something like that, which might be forgotten with a with a simpler API? Um, well, we in the attribute. I don't know if if I understand correctly, but in the attributes we can. Um, set usage flags um, to declare what a key can be used for or is actually allowed to be used for. And we can declare a lifetime. So if a key is volatile or persistent. Um, so, and of course, software and software implementation could check that. And if, if the key is actually intended to be used for a specific cryptographic operation. Is that what you meant? Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, Hannes, is that, is that a question? I'm not sure right now. Um, hi. Um, no, it was, that, it was just a comment on the um, use of the PSA crypto API on the uh, with trusted execution environments and also with uh, separate processors um, when the call actually goes um, and sort of leaves the processor and goes to a different one. Um, but great work, uh, great presentation, and uh, really great stuff. Thank you.